On today's episode of Locked In with Ian Bick, I'm not only interviewing one, but two guests who also happen to be brothers. On today's episode, we dive into the lives of Lyle and Lonnie Jones, who are both sentenced to life in prison and released after the passing of the First Step Act on relation to drug charges. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe, and share. And if you guys are listening to this on our audio streaming platforms, leave us a review. These are the stories that will change your life forever. Thank you guys for tuning in to Locked In with Ian Bick. Lyle, Lonnie Jones, awesome to have you guys on Locked In today. This is our first interview where we have two people on the show that are also brothers. So I'm like super excited for this. I know in the beginning we had talked and we were going to do like two separate interviews. Um, who was I talking to? Lyle. Talking to me. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. we were like, you know what? Let's just do the whole thing together. So super excited for this. Thank you guys for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Thanks for definitely. Thanks for having us. Now, are you guys actual brothers? Or are you step brothers? What's the no, dynamic? Brothers, same actual mother, brother. same father, brothers. Interesting. So, how how was growing up for you guys? I mean, growing up was was it the typical two parent household? You know what I'm saying? Me and my brother, and we had a, a younger brother too. But we had a mother, father. You know what I'm saying? Father worked. Mother took care of the home, raised us well. It was we played sports. You know what I'm saying? Everything was good. We had a religious background and we was raised as as uh, children being respectful to our parents and to others. You know what I'm saying? This is how our father raised us. So we, our, our upbringing was amazing. Now, what did your family do for work? Well, my dad, he was a uh, various jobs. He, he was a um, uh, he worked in the halfway house as a, as a director in the halfway house. He uh, worked in this, the school system the uh, Bridgeport um, public school system. And then he had a, not, a lot of little side jobs that he did to make ends meet the, uh, so we can be in a uh, household where we can financially be stable. So he did a lot of odd jobs also. And your mother? My mother, she, she basically was a stay-at-home mom, and then she ran a daycare also in the basement of our home. Now, I'm interested in hearing what you each thought of each other at that age. So, Lonnie, if you want to go first, what you thought of Lyle, and then we'll reverse it and get each other's perspective. Well, you know, he was big bro, right? So... I always looked up to him. He's my big brother. You know what I'm saying? He was amazing in sports, you know? So I always want, you know how the little brother always want to be like the big brother. So everything he did, I would emulate, you know what I'm saying? So, and we was, we close in age. So he, he want these type of shoes. I want those type of shoes. He wanted to play basketball. I want to play basketball. He wanted to play baseball. I tried baseball. I wasn't too good, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? so everything he did, I, I try to emulate as growing up, you know? And what did you think of Lonnie? Well, you know, he was, he wasn't the typical little brother. He always thought he was my big brother. Like, to, even today, he thinks he's my big brother. You know what I'm saying? I call him little big brother, you know? But um, since we were close in age, we did everything together. So it wasn't like, you know, we was five, six, seven years apart. We was like basically two years. So, and we were on the same size at that time. So we wore the same pants sometimes. We wore the same size sneaker, you know, and we went out together. It didn't change until I got my license and we, I was in high school and he wanted to tag along. That's when I'm like, you're 14, I'm 16. I got my friends, you got your friends. But you know, we was, but we was close. Growing up, we was close. Is there any like traumatic experiences in your childhood, like in the middle school or high school days? No. Well, tra one traumatic experience with me was when he got hit by a car. Okay. He got hit by a car. Me and him was crossing the street. And I think he was, what, eight? And about I was seven 10, or eight. seven or eight. I was like 10 years old. And he went in front of me and he got hit and went all the way up and came all the way down on the car and rolled. And I thought he was dead until he came and put the smell of salt under his nose and he, his yeah. legs was broke and all that type stuff. But that, 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 you know, that messed me up. I don't remember that to this day. <laughs> I don't even remember it. Do you think that like changed the dynamic of your relationship going forward as it you guys like evolved? It definitely changed the dynamic of my, how I felt about him. Like, cause you, the, the picture actually losing your brother in which at that time was my best friend. You know what I'm saying? We did everything together and we was actually playing and then trying to cross the street to go scare some people. And he just went in front of me. Yeah, it definitely changed. So, you know, I tried to cherish when he came out of that situation. I tried to cherish every every moment we spent together. And you kind of took like that older brother role in, yeah. in a sense? Like, protector. Well, yeah, like, you know, <laughs> more protector. Yeah, you try to be the protector. And definitely. do we see that like evolve when you guys start getting into business together like later on because of that moment? Absolutely, absolutely. Like we do all our businesses. We got four businesses together. 
Hmm. You know, we got four different businesses. Well, three, and then one, he's he's in Florida doing his thing, and, and there's another side one. But we got three businesses that we actually own together. Now, the city that you guys are growing up in, is there a lot of crime? Is there violence? Like, what are you yes. surrounded by? It's a lot of crime, especially when we was, before we got incarcerated. I think Bridgeport was like number three in the nation per capita as far as homicide rate. You know, Bridgeport, Connecticut. So it's a, it's it's flood. It's getting better, but it's it's a lot of crime out there. And how are you able to stay away from that, like as kids growing up? Well, we we uh like my dad, he moved us out. Like we was born in the projects, but he moved us out into like a suburban area where we went to school away. Even though we went back and had friends and played, but his guidance and his his stance as a man kept us away from that. Like our, us, like saying, like we fear God, right? But when you fear your father growing up, like yo, I'm not gonna do because pops ain't playing. Pops know what it is over there; he ain't playing. So you have that fear and that 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 uh, respect for your father because you see how hard he work and trying to keep you away from that. And so we, that really what triggered us to stay away from that young. You know what I'm saying? Like he wasn't going for it, and then we knew that if we did something crazy, pop gonna see us. So what changes? Like where's the mindset shift? that you guys have that mindset, you're respecting him, and you, you know you wanna do good, where does it go south from there where you kinda like diverge off that path? Well, he started first. <laughs> oh, so you're blaming him. <laughs> it's not good to put blame. He started first. Okay. Uh, well, uh, me, and him was, me and him was in college. We was in college in North Carolina. What school? Right. Uh, he was going to North, North Carolina, Carolina Central. Central. I was going to community college. I had just left uh, New Hampshire. I was on a four year scholarship in New Hampshire. Me and my coach got into it. I ended up leaving after like two years and going down with him. And what are you guys majoring in? I majored in accounting. And I majored in accounting also. Okay, and really? minor in marketing. That's yes. really interesting. And minor in marketing. Yep. Okay. And uh, we was down there. You know, my father, he gave me a job at a halfway house, working in a halfway house. So I left school and came back to Connecticut. He stayed in North Carolina. And while in Connecticut, one thing led to another. I started hanging with the wrong people, you know, just seeing things. Not actually doing it, but just seeing it, just hanging with friends that's involved, you know? And once they got involved and I'm watching and I'm observing, eventually, well, like one of my friends, he got, he got arrested. And he said, he said, Speedy, man, can you, uh, I need you, man. You're the only one I trust. Can you go out there and collect this money from me? And I collect some money from him. It was like $40,000 I had to collect from him. That guy's owed him and, and, and he's like, just get me a lawyer. I got him a lawyer. You know, and I said, what you want me to do with the other 20, 25,000? He said, keep it. Just put some money on my books. I never had $1,500 in my pocket. You know, I never had 15. Now here I am working, making $500 a week. He gives me 25,000 and tells me to keep it. What is he doing to get that? But I know what he's doing. So eventually I'm like, from observing it, I start doing what he was doing. In your mind, are you like, wishing you didn't know what he was doing exactly that's why i say like we it's cliche but we say people places and things just hanging with certain people hanging in certain places and wanting certain things and while me doing that everything that my parents taught me was out the window just in a matter of seconds in a matter just seeing that and then trying something and it worked well i thought it was working and just trying something and it worked. So you're saying a guy that never had 1,500, that got 25,000, that 25,000 turned into 50 to 100 to 150. I mean, I'm 22 years old. And so basically your whole life changes all because of who you associated with. You who had a friend that asked you for a favor. For a favor. That See, that's like the wild part about people's <laughs> stories, that one yeah, thing. That one thing. Like for me in my story, it's like that one house party I threw that led to me throwing bigger parties, which like ultimately landed yeah. me in prison. Yeah. So that one favor, and that just shows like the type of person you are wanting to do that favor. That's like a friendship, that's a, that's a true friend right there. And you do that and it changes your life. So how does that evolve in that instance? What do you start getting into? Now I start getting into, we, well, actually I was selling uh, heroin and crack. We were selling heroin and crack. Just right away, like as soon as that. Yeah, because like I said, I was sitting there observing them. I'm from the project, so I see, I know how things move. You know, it's not, so the projects is just flooded with drugs. So I know how things move. So what I, so from me just watching and knowing who he knew, and I had money. Once you have money and you know certain things and you got money to work with, you can go buy drugs and you can flip it and flip it, flip it, and then you just try something and it works. 
Now, there's no turning back now. Now it's hard to even stop. And it first starts out, okay, well, let me just get this nice car or let me buy this house. Now, once you get all that, now what you're going to do? Now you want more and more and more. And that's what happened. How much are you making a week when you first start? When I first started a week, uh, it was a long time ago. It was uh, a week, probably about 50 to 60,000. That's cute. Which is a lot back then. That was cute. <laughs> back then, I thought I was making some money. That's a, that's a lot for no, back. No, it's not a lot. But I thought it was a lot. A 50, 60,000 a week. That, yeah. People don't make Listen, that a year. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's every, when I first started. So this is early 2000. No, this is early 1994. 1994. 94, and you're like 23, 24. Yeah. And I make, yeah, I'm 22. Like 22. And uh, just got from college. And I'm making probably about fifty to sixty thousand a week. And this is the first crime you ever commit. Ever commit. Never been to jail before. Nothing. Now, do you have like a team under you, or is this just you? Yeah, I had I had a couple people that was my friend of my friends who knew how to do certain things. Yeah. You know, so they uh yeah. So I had the money, I had the the product, and they. And he did that. Is your dad asking you what, like, what the hell are you doing if it's you're funny working? It's funny you ask that because I had so much respect for my pops that he's hearing things and he's asking him like that. You know I ain't selling no drugs. <laughs> you know, I would never do nothing like that. You know I'm not out there. And so I used to have some of my workers sit on each corner. And when they see my father come through the projects, because he's a prominent guy in my projects. He'd come through and just ride through. They'd be like, yo, your pops is coming through. And I go and I hide. Wow. And I'll be looking out the window. And when he leave, I come out. And I'm a grown man. But that's the respect issue that we had. I didn't want to disappoint him. And I'm sitting there lying to him. And then I got so big that it's not, it, I couldn't hide no more. Now, Lonnie, do you hear about his drug business while you're still away at school? Now, matter of fact, I came back because I had came back. Um, I had left school because I had ended up getting my first daughter mother pregnant. So, you know, we always taught like, you know, my father was there for us, so I gotta be there for my kids, you know what I'm saying? So now I come back, he, this dude now, right? He got cars, he got money, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, yo, you tripping. Like, I'm like, I'm just coming back, I'm like, you tripping, man. You know, I said, Pops taught us all this and you out there tripping like that. I used to blow on him, right? Yeah. Like, man, you all tighten up, man. See it come through. But I seen all this money right now. I'm like, I'm working at a health, health insurance company. I'm like, but well, he coming through with thousands of dollars. I'm like, paying. Paying his car note. I'm like, yo. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. so, but I'm like, yo, you tripping, man. You, you know what I'm saying? There's only two ways it's going to end. Right? We know this. We was taught this. You know what I'm saying? We had uncles and stuff and family members that went through this already, right? And uh, as it going on, like, I'm I'm still good, right? I'm working, whatever. My, my daughter born. I'm taking care of my children all that. But he goes to jail. He goes to jail. Yeah. I get locked up. I get caught in, in New York. And I end up I end up going upstate New York. I went to Elmira. First they sent me to shock. I got kicked out of shock program. I end up going to Elmira. So the first time you're arrested, he's not involved in this drug no. business yet. Now, going back to that for one second, do you just like want to not be involved with him? Like I know the money is good and, and whatnot, but do you want to stay away from him? Even no, though I never brother? stayed away from him, but I was staying away from what he was doing. Yeah, I, was doing okay. I would come out there because you know you got money. There's a lot of women around, like this. So I'm like I'm having fun with him. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. He, I'm go out. I'm the little brother with you know what I'm saying with the brother that got the money and whatever. I'm having fun with him, but I ain't doing what he's doing. I'm gonna get up in the morning and go to work. Now, is your mindset you want to keep the business away from him yeah, because he's your absolutely. younger brother? Absolutely. And, because okay. I didn't want my parents to have two boys out there. Yeah. You know, I got caught up, but I definitely didn't want him to get caught up. So you get arrested that first time. What happens? I got arrested. Uh, I was uh, I got arrested in New York City. I got caught with like, uh, I think, 250 grams of cocaine in New York. Uh, I made bond. A couple months later, I get sentenced to one to three. I go upstate New York. That's it, one to three years. Yeah, one to three years. Now, so, is this before like the Clinton presidency with like the war on drugs and everything like that? No, this that? is after. This is in the nineties. This is still in the nineties. This is in the nineties. Like so that's a, in a state case, though. This was a state case. That's a short amount of time then for that much. Yeah, right? it was. Yeah, New York was. I seen guys get caught with more and get less time. So it wow. was New York wasn't that bad in the nineties, like in the early. And it was powder. Mid-90s. It was a crack. Okay. You know, so yeah, I did. It was a one to three, and I went and I went to jail. Yep. Who's running your business while you're in jail? Well, when I when I came to jail, I made bond. So I was preparing to go to jail. 
So when I prepared, you know me, I'm just, okay, I got one year, got to do. They promised me a little six-month shock program. So uh, what I did was I stacked as much money as possible. Within that four or five months, I was out on bond, you know, hit it, and uh, and went to jail. Yeah, it, I didn't have to have nobody run it. I figured when I come back, I will pick up where I left off. And I'm sure your dad knows by this. Yo, point. now he knows. Yeah, he had to come bomb me out. <laughs> what does he say to you? What does he say to me? I called him from Central Booking. I said, Dad, you got to? Uh, can you come get me? He said, Where you at? It was like three o'clock in the morning. I said, I'm locked up in New York. He hung up on me. I called back. He said, Man, leave me alone with that, man. I said, I'm in. I said, He said, Leave me alone. He hung up. I go, if you ever been to court, I mean, uh, jail in New York, it's like night court. You have night court, you're there all day, and it was the weekend. Yeah. And uh, so when I go in front of the judge, when I come out to go in front of the judge, it's probably like three o'clock in the morning. I see my mother and my father there. So he act like he wasn't, but he came there. And they gave me a bond, and I called him. I said, listen, Dad, come get me. I'm going to give you the money back. I made bond, gave him the money back. He had a long talk with me about, do, you know, and I'm like, Dad, this is my last time. I'm sorry, you know, this gave him the whole spill. And uh, did you mean what you said when you said you were at done? At that time, I definitely did. So what? Changed? I mean, when I first went to jail, yeah, I was like, this is it. I used to write him long letters while I was locked up, and you know, because that one to three felt like for ten years. It felt like ten years back then. Well, that's your first time. That's ever my in first prison. time. So one year felt like ten years back. Then. I mean, my first two months in federal <laughs> prison felt like. Like looking back on it now, that was the longest fucking period of my life. Like those two months. Yeah. Just like and it felt like years. Are you guys communicating with each other while you're in prison? Yeah, he's coming to see me. Is he like saying, like, I told you so, you shouldn't yeah, have gotten he's saying into that. this? But he actually, he actually I don't know what he's doing. But uh he's so he asked me for some uh some money. They'll get what somebody else. He said something. He gave me some type of story, and I'm like, man, and I don't want to tell him where my money's at so because yeah, all thing, of it, he didn't want to tell me where his money was at. Because right? all of it is together. It's not like <laughs> okay, go get five G's here. You know, yeah. I got over a hundred and some thousand dollars over here saved up, and I'm waiting. I only got six months, seven months to do. I can't wait to get to my money. If I tell him, ain't no telling what's gonna happen. He knows where my money's at. So I tell him where I tell him he's giving me a spill. I say, yo, make sure you put and. You want me to tell a story? What you want to tell? <laughs> <laughs> so when, while, I'm, while I'm locked up, uh, I tell him where it's at. I got three like three months to go home. I don't hear from him. I'm calling, but I don't hear from him. We talk all the time. I really don't hear from him. So I'm like, man, this dude, man, I want to know where's the rest of my money at? You know? And um, so finally, it's my release date. And they picked me up from 100 Center Street in Manhattan. Him, my father, and my younger brother. And I can't wait to get to him. I'm like, man, this dude, man. So I, he, they pick me up. He in a rental car. My father wants to see he's driving. I see two big earrings in his ear. Yeah. Uh, two, <laughs> two big diamond earrings. Look like they're about $15,000 a piece, right? Oh, man. So I'm like, this is where my money going, man. Then I see a Rolex. I'm like, man, what? So, but he's, I can't say nothing because my father's in the car. So I'm just sitting in the back seat fuming, you know? So, um. We get back to uh, Connecticut. I go see my mother, boom, boom, boom. See my mother, see my father, see my brother, see family members. I tell him, let's take a ride. You take a ride. He's like, just calm down. He take me yeah, motorcycle. He's blowing on me like, yo. Yeah, you. I'm like, yo, yeah. He's like, just calm down. So he take me, uh, he take me motorcycle shopping. Motorcycle shopping. I don't want a motorcycle. <laughs> I, where's my money at? <laughs> the first day out, he take me, buy me, buy me a motorcycle. We, uh, then he take me to his apartment and stuff, you know, and, uh, it's money everywhere. And he throws me my money that I owe him. And then he has all this other money over there. He's on, got it on, on the floor. On the floor, everywhere. And I'm like, yo, what you, do? that took you a whole week to do? Now it's probably close to 100. He said, and he laughed at me. And he said, that was today. We did this today. Wow. I said, what? So my little $60,000 a week compared to his $80,000 in one day was totally different. So he took your money and turned it into an empire, essentially. An empire. What's going through your mind? Like, what gave you that idea? Because you were just asking him for a loan. So how do you get no, this idea? No, he wasn't asking for a loan. The, he he, he right. had other plans. I was always the, the thinker, right? <laughs> and I seen, like, I like, are they doing it like that? I said, but if I was to do this, 
I already know what I would do. You know what I'm saying? But I didn't want to go there. But like things started getting tight. I would think I had my second child coming now. I was like, man, I know bro got this money there. I got some partners I know that could put me out. Because I didn't really know the, the street business like that. I mean, I've been around it, but I, I didn't know. But I had friends that I went to high school with and stuff like that. Like my partners, like they was knee deep. I got this money. And we got the respect of the project because from, from family, right? So I can know I got a spot where I can move product if I want to. So I just put two and two together, call my man up like, yo, boom, boom, boom. I need a one, two, whatever. Show me this, boom, boom, boom. So I learned certain things. I mean, I took some some hits. It ain't like it was just I got it and everything went good. Mm -hmm. I took some hits, right? But I had enough to bounce back. You know what I'm saying? Like I might lose money. People beat me, run off with like... This basketball playing, this college dude, he don't know, he don't know what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? So I took a few hits, but then I figured it out. You know what I'm saying? I thought I got scared at first. I'm like, yo, bro, gonna kill me. I'm about, I'm losing this money because I'm losing at first. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Bro, gonna kill me when he come home. I know you wait banking on his money, right? And he don't know I took it. I ain't no thief, but he know I try my hand, I flip it, and I get it back to him or whatever, right? But once I once I figured it out. It was like it just went to a whole different level, like unexpectedly. Yeah. You know, I had a, I had my man. He showed me like showed me what to do. He kind of got me contacted with some connects out of, out of out of the city and stuff like that. And it just went haywire. Do you think it would have been harder to do this if you didn't grow up where you grew up because you had like the basis? Yes, it to build been this harder. foundation. It's definitely been harder. We we yeah, like we knew the pro we like the project we from. It always been like a multi million dollar project. Like, I don't know what's going on today, but like, since we're growing up, I mean, we know people that made millions of dollars in this project. Yeah. Literally, no no exaggeration. So the project by itself, because it's right by the highway and things of that nature, so it, it always made a lot of money. You know what I'm saying? And then when, being that we was from there and we played basketball out there and everybody knew us, and then our, and our family had respect out there, we also had the respect out there. You know what I'm saying? So it made it easy for me to come in there find the workers, whatever, and put everything in play. Yeah. Is your dad checking in with you to make sure you're not following his path while he's in now, prison? See, I'm grown. I see me, like me now, my heart done got so hard now and so my desire done got so thirsty for, for, for wealth that I ain't even tripping on pops no more. That's how, like, that's the disrespect that came. Like, this is how money changes you. Like, I'm getting this, like, pops just gonna have to know. So pops, like, he had run, like, now nah, I just stand out there, like, what up, pop? <laughs> he said, like, my, like, like, we Muslim, right? So my father come in, like, yo, here, just ride by. He said, you know what I taught you? Like, he said, just appear that you, you doing this. It just appear that was an illusion. I'm like, Pop, what you mean, it's illusion, man? I got a 740 BMW. I got this. I got that. I got houses and all this. What you mean, it's an illusion? You know what I'm saying? Then he said, when you forget Allah, Allah forget you, and he just ride off. He must have been sick seeing you following down oh, yeah. his path. Man, listen, absolutely. Him and my mother. Sick. They want to yeah. take no money from us. No like nothing. They're like, nah, we don't want that. I bought my mother a car one time, and 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 she was like, oh, that's nice. You want to do something for me? Go get a job. <laughs> I'm like, what? Here's a car. Yeah, but that's how they were. Though. But that just shows like the parents' love for their child too. That they yeah. knew what you guys were doing, yeah. but they weren't going to go to the level where they're like ratting you out. Yeah, like, they're right, supportive, yeah. but they're not at the yeah, same time. Exactly. So when you got out of jail, did you have every intention of not getting back into the business? Absolutely, I I didn't for two weeks. Yeah, what you told me? You're like, I'm a chill. I right? said I'm a chill. I told him. I, I said, said I'm, I said chill. I'm good. I seen all that money, but I, my mindset was I just did a year, and it was the hardest year I ever did in my life. And so when he so when he was like, yo, bro, this is us, I'm like, nah, I'm good. You know, he just got I just got a motorcycle. He gave me a car. I had a car. And he gave me my money back. And I had and I had two kids. And I'm like, man, and I and I'm no stranger to work. I worked all my life, so I can go get me a job, you know, so I was good. You know, you talking about a young kid, I got over a hundred thousand dollars, a a car, and you know, and I got two kids, apartment, I'm good. And uh, but I'm hanging with him. Like I said, we best of friends. So I'm just I'm around again and I'm seeing him collect, 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 collect. And then he came. What happened was he came through in a brand new 740 BMW. He came through with rims and he came through and everybody was like, oh, and I'm sitting there like that night. I said, you know what? I'm back. He came to me. He's like, listen, 
I'm back in. <laughs> so <laughs> now the dynamics change. It, it flip flopped. Before it was he was around watching you. Now exactly. you're watching him. Yeah. So how's the dynamic when you guys team up together? It, who's in charge? We both. We was partners. You were partners? partners. Yeah, I got some like this. Everything was partners. Because you know, I got my start with his money. Yeah. Even though it wasn't what I was doing, but like you know, I took that and and and, and built this. This is ours. So we I gonna had, run it together. And I respected that at that time because. He, whatever he was making in the day, he had to split, it was split in half. So if he's making $80,000 in one day, he was making 40 now. So, you know, so that, he was taking a hit, you know? So now, but he was trying to bring, he was like, yo, bro, what's up? And I'm like, I'm good, I'm good. He wanted to break bread with you. Yeah. Now, because of your college background with accounting and stuff, did that help your business? Cause you're able to legitimize it in a way? Absolutely. And this is why we believe the judge gave us a lot more time than we supposed to, he, he felt that we were supposed to have got because he felt that we took, we took what we learned in school and brought it to illegal business. So how exactly did you do that? How does the accounting play into your business? What's like the inner workings of this drug empire essentially? See, a lot of people that sell drugs, they don't have, they just sell drugs and they just see the money coming in. We knew profit margins. We knew what margins. If we can do this on certain days, we can make this. And in a week, this would be this. So we plan and we sat and we plan things out. So all the marketing strategy. The marketing strategies. Make, make, make things look beautiful. Make the colors look beautiful. Make the bags look beautiful. Make the name sound appeasing. And then we, and then I had, we, we were visionaries, right? We, I had a vision, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is just temporarily. Now we're gonna move into real estate. We're gonna move into these things, right? Because so for me, this is not going to be my life. I know what's the end of this. I know my father embedded this, and I, we done seen it. Yep. Because we was only I was only in the street what two two years before they came and got me. So did you have a number you wanted in your head to get out? Because like a lot of the dealers I've talked to or the the fraud guys, they have a number in their head, and, they, and you never stick to that number. You always say yeah. a number. Everybody well, says a number. But what was your number? My number when I first started, I was like. I'm gonna get his money back and get what he got, and I'm stopping. So that didn't, <laughs> that didn't happen. I told you with me, it was it was a house and a car. Right. Yeah. But see, the thing is, as 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 you get bigger, and the money coming in, your 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 uh, accessibility is less. Like you ain't around no more. Like everything is just like a well oiled machine. It's just running. You might just come through just to show your face, let people like don't play with us. You know, we still around. But you ain't even there. So it's like you making all this money, and you ain't even got to be seen. You know. So and that's how we were. Like. What kind of drug dealers are you? Are you guys like violent or not so much because you came up from a very different background than the people that were surrounded by you? By nature, we're not. By nature, like growing up, like we weren't violent, right? But in that game, it breeds it. You know what I'm saying? Things happen. You know what I'm saying? When you're moving that much money and, you, and you're on that type of, type of lifestyle, things happen. That's the, you can't escape that. So you became someone you never wanted to be. Absolutely. Become. Absolutely. When's like that first moment or dangerous situation where maybe you guys have like a realization, you're like, holy shit, this is a different game than what we grew up in. The thing is, you don't even realize it, right? Because you get so embedded in it, it becomes the, like you normalize it. It becomes normal, like carrying a gun, a bulletproof vest. That, that's what we did every day. That's wild. And the justification, we justify whatever we do. We just justify anything that happens and it could be something minimal. We'd be like, man, he violated. And it's in... Looking back, we was in a way. Yeah, we wasn't. We was in. We was. We was tripping. You know. What I mean? But when you actually in it, and that's why when we talk to young kids, I understand. Like when you're in it, you ain't. And we had people in our ear. But when you're in it, and you so far deep, it's hard. And I liken that to like you see a lot of people that use drugs, and you be like, man, how he? That's how it was. We're getting money. Addiction. People that you, it was an addiction. And you'd be like, man, why he keep going back? But he's addicted to it. You know, he'd go to rehab, I go to jail. You know, he'd go to rehab, come back and relapse. I go to jail, come back and start getting money again. It's the same thing. Are you guys using yourselves or are you just strictly business? Man, I never smoked a cigarette. Uh, we, I never, we don't, we wow. never, just, we we don't we, drink, we, smoke, none never. Of we, ever. none of that. No. Really? So, so you weren't influenced. It was strictly about money and business. It was, I gambled though. I gambled. Gambled. Okay. We, 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 we shot a lot of dice. <laughs> oh, we got to get into that. We I, shot a lot of yeah. I shot a lot of we dice in my gambled. day. Yeah. Awesome. So 
there what what what's like the like the first time that something like you guys were in a violent situation that could have ultimately affected one of you guys that could have changed like the dynamic of the business was there any like situations or were you guys Most mostly people. respected and no one touched you no 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 it was it was people that it, i mean we were respected by a lot but it was it was people that actually tried you know and and like you know it's 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 people that had to drop on me who who you know they by the grace of god i'm still here you know what I'm saying? It could have went totally left. They had to drop on me, and for whatever reason, I'm still here. Yeah. You know. But the thing is, like, we had we had built such a a, a team, right? And we had some men with us that people revered. They feared bodyguards. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We had people like like don't even try them because they all coming, right? You know what I'm saying? So and, and when it was like that, so people feared that, right? But at the same time, we still was respectable. We didn't disrespect people and just do crazy stuff unless they violate it. And then in the, in, in the game, like when you're in the street, somebody violates, it's like, yo, he can't get away with that because somebody else going to try you. You know what I'm saying? Nah, we ain't like, some, one or two people might have got a pass because we might have liked his, his mother or we knew his family, right? We don't give him a pass. But if you cross that line, like something, something got to happen. Now, does your, do you think your dad realizes how powerful you two have become in this yeah. area? Yeah, he knew. And he's just completely removed from the situation. Like there's see, no trying as, to stop as a, you. As a parent, right? How my dad is, right? He he removes himself from the situation, but he never removed himself from giving us guidance and talking to us and trying to get us away from that. He stayed on us. Like, listen, man. I mean, every time, every chance he get, man, y'all gotta tighten up. You know how this is gonna end. He tell you, you know how it's gonna end. Every time, like he would never support what we did, but but. Let me rever uh, reverse that a little bit because if the police was out of pocket with us, even though we doing wrong, if they was crossing the line, he going to bat for us though. Really? He going to bat for us. Wow, that's even though we doing wrong, but if they violate their code, and he they, coming. And they violated plenty of times. He coming. Now at the peak, how much are you guys bringing in in, in money? The peak, what is it like? Half a million a week. Easy. All Because it was like, what, about 120 a day? Yeah. Like 40 a shift. We had three shifts. It was like, at the peak, it was like, man, I, I'm glad we can't get reindicted for this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all just the powder? You didn't never get into anything else? Or you guys no, we had heroin No, it was crack. heroin and crack. Heroin and crack, crack, that's it. Yeah. yeah heroin and crack. Now, did you guys have like principles as drug dealers? Like, don't sell the kids or don't do this? Like, were there certain we rules? We definitely wasn't selling the kids. No. You know what I'm saying? And other than that, it was fair game. And I didn't want, like, if you see a pregnant lady, I used to tell, I used to tell her workers, like, because we didn't sell hand-in-hand. I didn't hand. sell hand-in-hand. Hand. We, we didn't, didn't sell see hand. what's going to I used to tell, like, the workers and stuff like that and our lieutenants and stuff. to so make sure you see about somebody pregnant, man, let her go somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? Let her go somewhere else. Because we still had somewhat of a conscious. Now, how old are you guys by this point? Like, when it's nearing the end of, of this empire, how old are you guys each? I'm 25. And I'm 20. So, like 24, 25. Yeah, I'm, like, 26. You're 26. When do you first find out that they're investigating you and who exactly is investigating you? You always felt it. We felt it, right? Because we know we was too big for the city. Like, Bridgeport is small, right? I mean, as far as land-wise. And we was like, we had, like, everybody in our, in our, in our I call it a team, right? In our, in our team, they all had expensive cars. Everybody from the lieutenants and that, expensive cars, motorcycles, doing whatever, going to strip clubs, doing all that stuff that, I guess people do now, right? So we was really too big for the city. One day I seen it, right? We pulled up. My father had a food truck in the project, right? And we pull up, and I got my Beamer. My man got his Range Rover. My brother got his big Expedition. Eddie bowered out. And then we got up. Uh, my other man got his Navigator. And we got all these cars parked right there. And I looked. I said, yo, we going down. <laughs> <laughs> he said that true. I said, we going down. Yo, we too big for here. We need to be in New York or somewhere. Like, we, like we can't have cars and stuff like this. You know what I'm saying? We too big for the city. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And that's when I knew, like, yo, something had to change. Then you felt it, though, right? But they really wasn't honest yet until, you know, that, that, that November 6, 1999, right? Why didn't you get out of the game in that instant when you realized that? To be honest, right, I was, I was getting stressed out because I was, because, you know, with the, with the, uh, with the streets, you start beefing and stuff, right? So things happen. So I'm like, yeah, I'm tired of these little nut kids, man. I ain't, these, these, I'm tired. Of, I'm about to buy a house down south in North Carolina where I went to college at. 
Move you know at the time you know, my my ex wife down in North Carolina man we we good raise raise my family I'm like yo I'm I'm telling my uncle when I'm in the car right I'm like yo I'm done with the street man that's I'm about to move you know what I'm saying so that night when I'm telling them this yeah the cop the cops was actually looking for me they were looking for me because I got into an altercation with somebody like domestic dispute and um they were looking for me and they pulled him and two of my uncles over looking for me. And they found guns and vests in the car with them. The feds picked the case up yeah. after that, picked their case up. So now I'm out by myself. So he's arrested for By those... the feds for, for gun. First I made bond first. He, the state he made bond, the state picked it up. He got caught in the state. They, we, they made bond and like two, three days later, the feds, right, the the feds, feds grab, came they grabbed me. and grabbed him. And didn't get bond from that? No. Yeah. And that was that was the last time you saw daylight at that point. So last time I saw daylight, and I but told I, I told him I said, "Yo, it's the, the feds is coming." I said, "I ain't got no record, right? I'm a first time nonviolent offender. I just got caught with a gun. How I don't get a bond for a gun?" So I tell him, "I'm I like, yo, they coming." He told me that. I said, "They come." I said, "Make clean everything I said, what are you up." They coming because what they told me was the cops told me when I put when it because he pulled they pulled me and him over, and and they arrested him again. But it was really the feds. It, they was working for the feds, and they arrested him, and they let me go. They arrested him for loitering. So they told me he's like, no, he shouldn't have been out here. He's loitering. I'm like, well, why are you taking my brother for loitering? So he's telling me in the car. He's like, yo, man, it's the feds. I said, man, he said it's loitering. I'm like, yo, it's the feds. Bro. I'm telling. <laughs> I'm you. like, man. So he goes down to the our little precinct or whatever, and come to find out that it was a federal complaint, that he had a federal complaint for a gun charge, and it was the feds, you know. And the, they had picked up the gun. And this is where their investigation into the drug business starts? Right. Yes. How do they find out to connect the guns to the drugs? They already was like, invested. this pushed the investigation up. So like, like there they, was another team investigating and they kind of connected the dots? Yeah, they connected, they connected the dots. But what happened was because it was him and two of my uncles, right? So now... Whatever drugs and other illegal activity they, they was investigating, they they chose to just leave that, just push that. We're gonna indict them on all of this now, because they was investigating for you know they was gonna just leave us out there for a little longer, because we had no wiretaps, we never got no caught pictures, with drugs, no pictures, no money, no nothing. What's the evidence then? The evidence was we had testimony. Test, yeah. The, the, the judge said direct uh, testimony is direct evidence. I mean, they had a few vests. Like we get caught with vests, and they keep them in the precinct. They had some guns. That was the key they, evidence. So that's me, all they guns. ever found on you guys was guns and. I vests. never got caught. I never got caught with no drugs. No they never drugs. found it. All they, on us personally was the gun and the vest. And I, I could wear a vest because I, I didn't have no record. The vest was a nothing. It was yeah. the gun. But what they did was any like. If they found drugs, what they say was our brand that we sold, they started saying this was, they started giving us that. You know what I'm saying? This was the brand that they sold. Yeah. So that was the drugs they used. Nobody, if they found it in a car or they arrested somebody, they attached that to us. What about your assets? Are they seized at this point or no? So your assets were always safe? Our assets were safe because he got picked up by the feds. And when he got picked up by the feds, I was still out. And you did what you had to do. You <laughs> for like, he was out for around. like five months. I was out like for like uh, about three months. I was out three, four months. At, but three, four months, I was out. The feds and I knew picked they were you coming. up. That's they picked me up like four the, months later. They came with the drug indictment. A drug indictment. And they came at you hard? They superseded his, yeah, they came at us hard. And where were you when you got arrested this day? I was at a friend's house. Actually, they was looking for me. I was on a run. They was looking for me for uh, a murder. Yeah, in you, the state. you and Lewis are both on the run. I was on a run. <laughs> I wasn't was on a wanted. run per se, but it was like they were. I heard they were looking for me for a state murder that had absolutely nothing to do with mine, mind you. And uh, and um, they, I was gonna turn myself in for that, but I wanted to see my kids first. And some they got wind where I was at, and they came in and they took me. They came in hard. They came in hard and took me. And I, in the back of my mind, I still was hoping that it was for the murder, and not the feds, because it was. And so the state came in with the feds, but sometimes they work together, and they take me. They say, "Yeah, you're going to court Monday for the state." I'm like, "Oh, thanks." 
They said, but right now we'll take you to federal court to get you arraigned for drug conviction. I'm like, oh my God. But by this point, you have all your, are you guys done with the drug business essentially? Yeah, actually I was done probably five, six months prior to, about four months prior to him even going to jail. And everything's cleaned up, you're good? Yeah, I'm not, yeah. So it could have been a lot worse evidence wise had you continued to do oh, what you were oh, doing. Oh, no question. We'd have smashed. No question. Not outcome wise, because they were going to screw you regardless, but no evidence wise. Evidence it wise, yes. They jumped the gun. And what they relied on was people telling. So they should have watched a little bit more. And that's what to build that was whole, our whole argument. They, there was no videotape of us doing anything. There was no evidence of the cars, money, drug, nothing. They just had people saying we had this, we did this, and they worked for us. Now, are you guys communicating with each other through a lawyer or something while you're both in prison? We was together. We was together. You're in the, the, in the federal detention holding. center. In where's in, this detention center? Rhode Island. Was that Wyatt? Wyatt. Yeah. The, so Wyatt was around, and this is the '90s. Yeah, this, this yeah, was 99, 99 2000. 2000. Dude, that's where I was because like uh, a lot of people <laughs> I'll meet with, they ha normally have a county jail that's held in yeah. the feds. But Wizen in Connecticut, White. there's no. Wizen yeah, White. I was in yeah. the county for the first six months uh, for the gun. Yeah. And then when they indicted us, like the, a month later, I met them up and they sent me up to Wyatt with them. Yeah. Okay. So you guys are transported to Wyatt. So are you in the same pod? Yeah. Same cell. Same cell. Why'd they do My that? My whole family. Same case and it's- a Everybody. It was like- 10 of us in the same block. That's interesting that they put you guys all together. All together. So they're not trying to turn you guys. Oh, they, exactly. they were trying to turn. They try to turn people. So what is the logic of putting you guys all together? No, no, no. They came in, the ones they felt that was weak, they yeah. came and took them out. Yeah. And brought them to another jail where they had contact visits and all that type of stuff. And those are the guys that end up turning. Actually, they didn't. Wow. <laughs> Actually, they didn't, but they was working on them hard. So how long are you at Wyatt for and what's going on in the like the legal process? What are your lawyers telling you guys? Do you have like a paid lawyer or public defender? Oh, we have paid lawyers. Okay. Yeah, we so, have paid so lawyers. My lawyer, the first, um, I had him for my gun charge. And then when they indicted me for the, uh, the drugs, he took the drug charge too. But like right before I'm about to start trial, because they um, severed our case. We always want them to go to trial together. They didn't want to do that because they had they didn't have no evidence. So they wanted to pick, put me as this person as a boss. They wanted to put him as a boss. They wanted to put my uncles as a boss, right? So if they would have brought us together, it would have been chaos. So they half of us was going uh, to trial. Then they got superseded on violence, yeah, right? And we didn't get superseded on violence. And the day before we had a status hearing, they removed my attorney from my case. Took them off. How could they just remove the lawyer? Yo, I was sick. And I had, you know, he, he was an animal, right? They feared him, right? You know what I'm saying? And uh, right, we going to a, for a status hearing, but it was another big time drug dealer from my, from my city that he represented. He was becoming a snitch. You know what I'm saying? Against you. So they, he, really, I, we didn't know he was going to tell against us, right? Because he, he really couldn't tell nothing against us. We never dealt with him. But he was making up stories. Mm -hmm. And the government knew it. We didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So they said, like, it's a conflict of interest, boom, 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 this and that. So they removed my lawyer off my case. And I had to, I got severed out. And, I, and a, a year later, I went to trial by myself. Yeah, so that's how that happened. And what's going on with your case? While, are you on trial at the same time, just different cases? No. They superseded me and hit me with um, violence. They had hit me with violence. So we, I got hit with RICO, RICO conspiracy. Uh, murder, Vicar, Vicar all, all kinds of stuff. All federal, though. Yeah, all federal. And he was just on a drug, one drug, on a drug count. And so they severed our cases because he couldn't go with us because of the violence. Okay. So he couldn't go with us. So he went to trial before me. I actually, I was three, three and a half years pre trial before I even went to trial. How does your trial turn out? What do you mean turn out? They smashed me. <laughs> you lost every, every count against I only had, you? I only had one count. You just had one count. Drug conspiracy. That's it. That's it. And you lost that. Uh, obviously, you lost that one count. But. Yeah. And, 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 and the best evidence that they had against me was from somebody who testified that wasn't even part of my organization. How much time are you facing on a drug conspiracy charge? Life. It, it's life on that. So you get, you get, you lose a trial, you go back to the detention center. Right. How long after till you're sentenced? Uh, I lost trial in December. I got sentenced in March, I believe. And what's your sentence? Life. And you're how old? At that time, I was 27. So what's that feeling like to get sentenced to life in prison at 27 years old? For me, uh, when, when, when he, because I, once I lost trial, 
I knew I was going to get like, so the, the, the thing is when I lost Sha, it was like, that was the emotion like, damn, I'm hit. I got to fight. You know what I'm saying? But by that time, like I became, I started becoming like spiritual, right? I started getting into my religion and I knew like, yo, they only could give me what God going to allow them to give me. I ain't tripping. You know what I'm saying? And I should tell my brother that, you know what I'm saying? I was like, they can't do nothing but what God gonna allow them to do. Like I'm getting into like my spirituality now. Like you know, all the things that my father taught us. Now we sitting back and, and it's replaying. Now, all the things he used to say is replaying. So now like man, let me my back against the wall. I gotta turn to the one who will get me out of any condition. You know what I'm saying? So I started doing that. So when I started doing that, man, when they gave me the life sentence, I was cool. I just felt bad for my parents and my kids. And so I'm good because I know I'm a fight. And God willing, I'm going to be out of this eventually. But my mom and my dad and, and, my, and my daughters was like two and four. I had three daughters. I was, you know, two was two and one was four. You know, and they, I know they, they ain't going to be with their dad for, the, for a while. What's that conversation like with your family? Like after you got life in prison? See, like my, my, my parents are strong. So my dad was like, we're going to keep fighting. He said, don't even worry about it, son. You ain't, he said, he said mark my word. This one, I, I swear, I never forget this. I called home. I, I, after I lost Charlie, he sent me back. To, I mean, after he gave me the life sentence, I went back to Wyatt and I called. He said, Mark my word, you will not do a life sentence in prison. He said, I'm going to fight tooth and nail to make sure you don't do a life sentence in prison. And that's what he did. Did that help keep you going? Oh, absolutely. Did you ever lose hope in like that, those couple months after? Never. You just knew that whatever it takes, you're going to get out of here. No, absolutely. I, I always felt like that. Even like when I was in prison, right? And I, was, I started out at uh, USP Coleman in Florida. They sent me way to Florida, right? They, they still wanted people to tell. They sent me to Florida away from everybody. They put separations on us. So we couldn't be so together. So we couldn't be together once and we got sentenced. And you couldn't sentence, talk. Right? We couldn't write each other. Once I got sentenced, we couldn't even be around each other no more. The whole time in prison, right? But uh, when I got to Coleman, uh, I lost what I was talking about. What was I talking about just now? I'm getting old. They were separate. They separated they you, separated. sent you to Coleman. Yeah, they separated and sent us to Coleman. So now I'm by myself, you know what I'm saying? But I know I, I got to fight. I got to fight. So I get a job in a, uh, in a law library hallway. You know what I'm saying? So every day I'm in there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, I'm, I'm working, and I'm, I'm working on my case. That was my life. I had that hope, like, yo. And dudes just say to me, like, yo, you walk around here, like, um, you going home tomorrow. I said, I am going home tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Because people never knew I had a life sentence. They say, man, you out here playing basketball, you laughing. You got a life sentence? I said, yeah, man. What? What am I supposed to do? Hang it up? Nah, I ain't built like that. I ain't built like when, when adversity hit that I just fold. I wasn't raised like that. You know what I'm saying? So people are like, yo, I admire you young. I was young then. Well, I admire you, Jit. You know what I'm saying? Like you fighting. You, st you stood firm, man. You, and you walk around here like you, you going home tomorrow. I said, inshallah, God willing, I'll be home tomorrow. And that mindset carried you through. All the way through. I mean, I just think it's insane that they gave a nonviolent drug offender life in prison. First time. But that was the dynamics back yeah. then, too. That's what they were doing yep. to a lot of people. Yeah. So you're you're sitting at the USP in Coleman. What's going on with your case? Do you go to trial? Do you take a plea deal? What I, no, I definitely didn't take a plea deal. Um, they hit me with some violence. They hit me with a, They hit me with a murder. And the murder, it was... The murder that they hit me with, I had a hung jury, first and foremost. We went to trial. Me and four other co-defendants, we went to trial. And we had a hung jury. Twelve, on everything? On everything. 33 counts hung on 33 counts. One person held out, had us guilty. 11 had us innocent. One person had us guilty. And because they fabricated a lot of violence. Because it's, it's one thing about a drug conspiracy, it's easy to prove a drug conspiracy, but it's hard to prove violence. It's hard, and all these dudes was coming lying. They took, they hit me with a, a a murder, and I was in North Carolina at a at a family reunion, Fayetteville, North Carolina, at a family reunion. And when it happened, when it happened, when it actually happened, and I'm on videotape, I got hotel records, I got phone records, I'm literally, and how do five people come up with the same story th that I grew up with? They said they seen me kill this man. And I'm literally, so now I'm going to trial and they're telling the story, telling the story. Yeah, I seen Speedy do this. I seen Speedy do that. I seen him stand over him and all that. And my lawyer is like, no further questions, Your Honor. And then I got to put my defense on. And my defense was videotape. Look where he's at. 
Phone records. Look where he's at. Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm in Fayetteville. I checked in a hotel at 12 o'clock midnight in Fayetteville, North Carolina. The guy got killed 1 o'clock in the morning in Bridgeport, Connecticut. There's no way in the world I could have been there. Then I'm on camera. There's no way. So now the, ju the jury's looking like, what? And so they, um, we end up getting a hung jury. And they dismissed that count. They dismissed that count. Took me to sent us to a whole nother district, New Haven County, and and I lost on the drug. I lost on a drug count in a racketeering count, and they gave me three life sentences. So they got rid of the the, the violence because the aspect. violence the violence was hindering their their conviction yeah. because they were everybody was lying about violence. Because a lot of the times after a mistrial, they they usually don't pursue it unless they really exactly. want to go. So they after got rid you. of that one count. It's easy to convict me on drugs. You know, you got 20 people coming in there and say, yeah, I sold for Speedy. It's, it's, it's easy. You know what I'm saying? Testimony is direct evidence in the feds. You don't have to get caught with nothing. That's the craziest thing about the feds. Like I, in my scenario, I went to trial too. Uh -huh. And one, they overcharge you. Like yeah, they absolutely. stack them up. They so, stack them up. Definitely. Yeah, they're never gonna put you on trial for like a couple case, a couple counts in like a white uh, collar case. And then literally my business partner went on the stand lied my my lawyer brought a whiteboard and counted all the times he lied and they still convicted based off of his testimony and yeah. you can't get it stricken from the record you can't do anything they could say whatever and they could just use that against you yeah so you're convicted about three years after he sentenced i got convicted in 2003 and you haven't talked to him in all these years no we just write we haven't talked we just like he'll write letters and i had to write letters home home and, and my mother sent it to me and how are you feeling like to have that close knitted relationship growing up and now you're separated and you probably feel a little bit guilty that you guys are in this mess. I do. I do. I, I felt guilty. And especially when he when he first relieved the life sent received the life sentence, we was in Wyatt together and he went to go get sentenced. And when he but we was in different blocks at the time. And when he well, I was at the door, you know, I don't know if you I'm at the door watching him go to his block and I'm like, yo, what they give you? And he just put the L up. Wow. So that was harder for me than when I received the life sentence. That's gotta be heartbreaking. Right there. And knowing you can't have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I know it was always like exhilarating seeing guys leave for court mm -hmm. that morning and to, to go to sentencing and then mm -hmm. coming back and you just like see that look of defeat on them or anything like that. And to know that he got life in prison, your own blood brother. See, they was hoping I get 20. Ain't that's crazy, right? You're gonna get 20. Like we go outside, I go outside to wreck, right? Cause there's, by that time they had separated us from the block. And I guess where, we, where the rec yard is and, and why, you know how you see the windows and look in, in the windows? Yeah. And they room was right there and we'd be talking. Like, nah, they gonna give you 20, man. I'm trust me, you ain't got no record or nothing. They gonna give you 20. Yeah, I kept saying, you gonna give me 20. Man, they ain't giving me no 20, man. 20 was a popular <laughs> sentence. I was with a lot of guys that were that got 20 years that would get later commutated by Obama towards the end. And that's crazy. We was hoping we just get a number. 20, 25, 30, 30 years for drugs. How can you hope you get a number? Yeah. For drugs, you know, and it's and that's how it is. So your sentence, where do you go to? I get sentenced. I blow trial. I get three life sentences. They send me to USP Lee. And where's that? County. That's in Virginia. Now, do you have the same mindset that Lonnie was just speaking about, about having hope or are you diverging? Definitely not. So what's your mindset? My mindset is going in there. They gave me all this time. I'm going to get more money. <laughs> so what do you get what's prison like for you <laughs> i mean usp lee i'm like man they get i'm coming in here i still got my ears to the street i'm coming to get some money you know you've been in jail before you there's more drugs in jail than it is on the street oh it's wild it's wild so and what triggered it triggered me is and that's why god works in mysterious ways i'm in usp lee and they move me and i go to a block where there's a guy that's from my project is in there and he's doing like 27 years and he's heavenly, he's into religion real hard. And when I see him, you know, you go in the block and it's, it's a, you know, you see a guy, you got all these DC guys, Philly, New Orleans, Florida, and you see a guy from Bridgeport, Connecticut in there. One guy from Bridgeport that you know. And I'm like, and I was so happy to see him. And he moved me in his cell. And he knew I was, we, like we was Muslim and we was spiritual. In the street, when we was younger. So he's talking to me like, and I'm like, man, I'm not even on it like that. I Man, I'm trying to get this. But he stayed in my ear. And eventually I never did anything that my I intended to do when I went to jail. You know, my intentions was to do all kinds of stuff. But just being in that cell with him, 
I got back on my spirituality. And like my brother said, that's what saved me. I used to walk around a wreck. They thought, they said, man, you can't have three life sentences, three life sentences. Cause I'm playing basketball, handball. I'm going to the mosque. I'm reading, you know, playing Scrabble, playing chess, you know. So and this is very early on in your prison sentence that you have like this reawakening or, yeah, or journey. Yeah. So you go in like a young guy swinging, getting into shit you shouldn't mm -hmm. be. And you quickly turned into- Quickly turned. So you got back to that childhood self that again. Chi exactly. And everything that my father was teaching us cultivating resonated. Stuff. It came back and you see it. And that made the time ease. It made my time very, and I can't say easy because I had five kids and it was hard on them and my parents, but um, it, 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 it eased the pain a little bit. Now, you're like the, the first people I've interviewed that went to a USP in federal prison. So I just want to touch on that aspect of it. Uh, Lonnie, what's like the, the, the sleeping arrangements like? Because I'm sure it's a lot different than a dorm room setting that I was in at a low in a camp. Uh, the sleeping arrangements. Well, and, and, and so you didn't have to experience the politics of prison. So when you in a USP is pure politics, right? You have what would you call cars, right? You have a guy that's, to say, he from Florida. You got the Florida car, and you have somebody who's called the shot caller, right? He's the head of the Florida car, meaning like if something happened, to keep the peace amongst the the, uh, the compound, like if somebody violated from Florida, see somebody from D.C., the shot caller from D.C. go to the shot caller from Florida and be like, listen, your man violated such and such, you know what I'm saying? Y'all need to handle that before we handle it. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to take care of our own. A lot of stuff, it was politics. So the sleeping arrangements was pretty much like that unless you chose to do other. Like, I mean, like, uh, Florida's going to sleep with Florida. Like, if you're from Florida, I'm a, I'm a bunkie with somebody from Florida. If I'm from D.C., I'm a bunkie with somebody from D.C. I'm Muslim, so I don't want nobody in my cell but a Muslim because we live a certain way, we pray, we use a bathroom a certain way. And that's how the sleeping arrangements were. Like, you know what I'm saying? Where, where I was at. Now, you got some people that want to do their own thing and they'll take anybody in their cell. But with me, I'm like, yo, if he's not Muslim or he ready to conform to how I use the bathroom and things of that nature and keep myself clean, he can't move in here. Very segregated. Yeah. Very segregated. You, you, you've been, it's segregated. You have the whites with the whites. You have the blacks with the blacks. And, and, and you have the Mexicans with the Mexicans. And everything is segregated. Even the chow hall. You see the chow hall is the same way. And it's all, you're celled up, right? It's always, what's a lockdown situation? Is there movement? Are you in your cell all day? What's that like? Are you talking about just doing time in prison? Yeah. On a normal like, day? Yeah, on a normal day. No, you out. You out all yeah. day. Yeah. But Wreck you're locked yard. in at night. Yeah, locked in at night. And it, and it surprised me. Coming from Wyatt and going to the feds, it was like a, a resort. A, a, <laughs> yeah, cause because Wyatt's you, like a real yeah, jail. Like a resort, and they like, pop the doors at 6.30, you lock in at 3.30 for count, they let you back out at four o'clock and you lock in at 8.30. You're never locked in. You out all day, you could be outside on a record. And then back like then, I don't know when you came in, but back then the food was amazing. Yeah. The food was amazing. You tell them how you want your eggs. <laughs> tell yeah. them how you yeah, want them. Yeah. yeah, eggs the order. Yeah, yeah eggs the <laughs> order. You had, yeah. And the commissary is good. The commissary was great. Now back to the bathroom thing for one second because I had a certain experience with this. What is like the certain ways to use the bathroom in a cell, like proper cell etiquette? Uh, Cause like in my experience, I was yelled at for not kneeling down. Like you have to kneel down on like right, one so, knee or whatever. See like, cause you don't want to hear, like you in a cell with somebody, right? You don't want to hear that pissing noise. <laughs> Like man, you know, you <laughs> like you like, like man, I ain't trying to hear that. You bad enough you locked in with a with a, with a with a man, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't want to hear that, right? So if you kneel, it don't splash all over the place. Or if you sit, like I sit, you know what I'm saying? Like as Muslim, like you, you don't have to, but it's good because y'all want stuff splashing on my clothes. You know what I'm saying? And it's more like healthier for you, right? So we sit down and we clean ourselves. Like we don't just shake our uh, our joint, right? And like how we was taught, make sure you shake. You know, shake it and then you know urine go all over the place. You know, we sit down, we clean ourselves, and you know, we and we and we get up, and that's how we use the bathroom. So, being that we have to pray in our cell a lot of times, you don't want urine all over the, the cell. So you have, you got to like give certain etiquettes, man. We this is how we use. And the then bathroom. people walk with their socks, and you know, if you walk with your socks barefoot in your cell, and if somebody pissing, and then you know, sometimes you don't finish off. Everybody, I'm mean, you put it back in. You like, oh, man, it's going down your leg. Yeah, you already know crazy. everybody experienced yeah. that. You like, oh man, yeah. You know, so you don't, you don't, you don't want that. Now, when you guys went from higher security prisons down to lower security prisons in your journey, 
did you carry some of that etiquette that was at the USPs and higher security down the lower? <laughs> like for instance, I would meet guys that still walk to the shower with their boots on and put a chair. <laughs> Listen, what, what is like the logic between having your boots to the Listen, shower? I never understood that logic because if somebody was wanted to get you, they'd wait till you get in the shower and put your slip, flip flops on and then go get you. So I never understood why you just walk, walk to the shower. I didn't understand it either, but I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like dude, I guess they said like, because so, you know, it's just, I guess this is a mindset like if somebody tried me, I'm ready. But once you get in the shower, they can come up in there while you're in the shower. You can't lock yeah. the shower. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I, I did it because in a pen, that's what you do, right? And what do, you, what do you do? Like you put the chair in front of the shower? Put the, the chair in front of the shower. You know, you know <laughs> yeah. how you do. You put the chair in front of the shower. I would see guys and, do that. And yeah. you go to the shower with your knife. So you had like a steel rod or oh, something? Oh, absolutely. That's wild. Listen, when I first got the comb, it scared me to death. I've never been to jail before in the prison. I, I ain't going to say scared me to death because they ain't nothing soft about me. You know what I'm <laughs> but now... Uh, they have something, what you call like a, uh, what's that? The captain's meeting before you, they let you to the captain's compound. review. Captain's review. So I go in there and they telling me, uh, they see that I ain't never been to jail before and I got all this time. They said, oh yeah. They said, you know, you're in the penitentiary now. You ain't got your family here. You know, they read all your PSI. You ain't got no guns in here. You better get your knife. The captain tells me this. He said, cause if you step on somebody's shoes here or you disrespect somebody, they're gonna butcher you. Yeah. So I advise you to get your knife. Say less. <laughs> I went right to, I got up there, found some people, I found a Muslim, I need me a knife. <laughs> now, are you seeing violence regularly in, in these penitentiaries? I did. I, did. Oh, I was in a penitentiary time. for 12 years. I'm sure there's a lot of like sex offender related stuff that the guys that do get sentenced to there, like, are they allowed to walk the compound? No, is what no I'm saying? not at all. Not in a, not in a penitentiary. So how not does knowingly. That work? Now yeah. you find out later on that, yo, this dude, but sex offenders- You know, like child molesters and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, so like I've built a, like a strong social media following because we'll make jokes that I look like a sex offender because I have the glasses <laughs> oh, yeah, you, and whatnot. Yeah, they, they, yeah, so they, they see, say like you didn't oh. do real time, you wouldn't last a day in the pen. Where do they put these sex offenders in? Because there are ones that get life. They're not going right. to these USPs. So they got, they got these, what they call them, the, uh, like um, cheese factories and things of that nature. Yeah, they got- they like got they one in Arizona. Yeah, they for, for those. They yeah, got, like, they got like certain Larry jails. Nasser. They got certain jails where they- they put them and they're over there. People that told, people, just child molesters, they they got certain jails that they put them there. And some escape, some come there and act like they big and tough and they act like, and then you find out later that they was uh, a child molester. But no, Nobody was more harder on like a child molester than that, than the white boys. Than the white boys. They didn't play. Now, if, if you think like if I came to a, a USP, how do you think I would fare? Like just by looking at no me. question, they they would have made you would have had to get your paperwork that right there, ASAP. You right have had that. All right, so let's talk paperwork. Oh, they, they, by the <laughs> way, this is paperwork. So whatever me and my brother say can be substantiated, and verified, and verified right here. So they, I brought my paperwork. So it's my PSR, my pre sentence report, and my sentencing transcripts <laughs> and my docket sheet. Man, I love you guys. So that <laughs> we're, we're gonna be friends, man. So how does paperwork checking work at the USP? What was like your first experience with that? Well, they never, when I got the USP Lee and um, it was guys from Connecticut. They just told me, it was like, listen, man, we know your case. Cause they knew my case. I had a big case out of Connecticut. So, but I'm like, my paperwork could be here. They was like, nah, we don't got, I said, no, my paperwork can be here. So my paperwork came and they called a little meeting. I showed them my PSR, my PSR and my um, sentencing transcripts. And you know, they, they go over, you get a guy that who's at that time, he's the paperwork checker and he checks your paperwork. And he's like, okay, he's, he's good. I'm like, I know I'm good, you know? So, and that's how that works. Do you have a certain amount of time to show it? Where, I mean, years later when, yeah, it was, days. we had 30 days, Connecticut car. If you was from Connecticut or the tri-state, you had 30 days to show your paperwork. And if it didn't check out, it's pack your shit, go to the shit. You gotta get out of here. Unless you get an extension, unless you show proof that it's on its way. Okay. Or did you guys ever do time in the shoe during your yeah. sentence? Months. <laughs> months, yeah. Yeah. What was the longest like you guys spent in the shoe? I did eight months. I did nine. And what is this for? It was for investigation. Just for whatever? No, it was it was a, a, a brawl. It was a fight. This is before your reform in prison. No, I reformed. Huh. But I just had, I had, a, I, I reformed, okay. but I mean. Attitude problem. Yeah, attitude problem. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't be able to no, tell no, that. No. No, I like sports. Okay. So I like to play basketball, you already know. And then when you get to jail and, and when you get there, it's like, it's different cultures. So you have certain people that invite you to their private, where I'm from, you don't do that. 
And there's certain cults, certain people from different places, they there's no problem for them to invite you to their private parts. They you know? sex play, you know. And they sex play. you are you've been there. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You you know how they they say so when they, you know, and they say, yo, you and they invite you to their private parts, that's automatic go. I don't care who you with, I don't care who you are, I don't care. Y'all gonna have to beat me down. If you play with me like that, it's automatic on site. There's three things you can't do. You can't invite no man to your private parts. You can't call him no homosexual in prison, like if you're not. And you can't say if he's a rat if he's not. That's you, that's violent. Violent. I learned that like very quickly because where I come from, like what the way we grew up, it was casual for my friends to say like, "Yo, suck my dick" or like oh, whatever. Crazy. Just that's, like that's that. This new era. Yeah, that's what they do now. That's what, I see that all the time with they're these like, kids. You're a bitch. This and that. Just as a joke. Wow. So I'm playing a card game one day, and I said that, and the like the dude checked me, got up because he came from like a medium. He's like, "Dude, I know you're like you're brand new here, but if you say that, like you're gonna get yourself fucking what? hurt." If you say that, oh yeah. man. I literally had no idea because that was just like normal. No, because I, it literally, no, for real. I done seen people lose their life in prison for, for what to come out of their mouth. Yeah. No joke. Lose their life. People that say this dude is a rat and the dude wasn't a rat and he kept spreading stuff like that or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And I, I seen him the dude lose his life like that. Now, now, commissary food, do you guys have microwaves or not at the penitentiaries? Penitentiary, yeah. When we first came in, they had microwaves. Okay. They started taking them like yeah, after I, my, like my 15th year. <laughs> no, nah, where I was at, I was in Raybrook in, in 2015. Yeah, two, we still had microwaves. Now, how do you guys cook food without the microwave for hot commissary? Water. Just hot water. They have the hot That's water hot dispensers. Water. You have, you, and you have stingers. <laughs> Did you ever use a stinger? I seen the guys use it to make alcohol, like the the white. Oh, yeah, like to make the hooch, to make the hooch, white, white lightning. lightning. So you know what white lightning is? <laughs> okay, so I posted a TikTok video about how they used honey to make white lightning, sweet, and everyone said sweet. that's not how you sugar, make it. Or any whatever. type of sugar, yeah. Can you just explain that process? Oh, I don't know how to make it, but they do use but honey. They do use honey. any sugar, and that's, they boil it down. They boil it down. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I don't know. I that's don't know. why they stopped selling sugar. Yeah. In, in the prisons because they was making You couldn't a, even buy everything was sugar, sugar free. free. We used sugar to get Jolly free candy. Ranchers they melt them down. Sugar, yeah. 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 Hooch. That. I remember the first time I went to the bathroom at Fort Dix because there are these old beat up bathrooms and the Mexicans are removing the bricks. They have a rope and they're pulling out this big bag of well, hooch. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like got, that, yeah. it's like all covered in mold. This is yeah. what people are drinking. I was in Straight a place. Bacteria. I yeah. was in a place where they sold sugar free in, in Canaan. It would, they show sugar free everything. So a guy had come from, say, uh, another jail and have Jolly Ranchers. He would sell a bag of Jolly Ranchers for $15. It's crazy. That's what a bag of Jolly Ranchers went for, $15. Three books. Yeah, three books. <laughs> three books of stamps. <laughs> now, um, hustles. Lonnie, what's your prison hustle? My prison hustle is that I, you know, I'm a hustler, so I had, I had, I had stores. Oh, you're the store guy? I was the store guy. So how does that process work being and, the commissary guy? And I was, no, I wasn't the commissary guy. Oh, you're the st I had a store. So what's the difference between the commissary guy and the store guy? You know, you buy stuff from the commissary mm -hmm. and you do a markup in your store, like okay. you have in, in your cell, right? And also I worked in the kitchen on Common Fair, right? Like with the Jewish meals, the Common Fair people that took Common Fair. <laughs> yeah. So now, you know, when you got a good good relationship with the uh, soup, kitchen supervisor or whatever, they let you take bell peppers or tuna that they had on there, or honey buns. And then you hustle like that and you sell it to people that's on a compound and can't get it. But most of my money came from like my, my store, though, my prison store. Yeah, I had like one of the biggest stores on a compound. And how much money are you making a week from this? Uh, I mean, jail-wise, probably like probably like $200 a week. Are you able to convert that into physical cash? Oh, absolutely, because you, you get stamps and people like to gamble. I didn't gamble. People like to gamble. I stopped gambling once I went to prison. So they'd be like, yo, how many books of stamps you got? I said, man, I got, I got about 100 books of stamps. I said, $500. I'll get you for $350. They send me $350, you know what I'm saying, to my, to my books. I send it home to my family, and they put it on my books. Now, what's the currency on the compound back in the 90s? Is it the mackerel pouch? Where I was then? at, it was stamps. Stamps. Just stamps. Stamps. Yeah, where I was at, it was stamps. So when, this is interesting, when did it become like the mackerel through different, your- Different places do different, different things. Because yeah. when I went to- uh, Ed, South, uh, Edgefield. Edgefield, South Carolina, it was mackerel. Okay, you know that's interesting. I'm trying macro. to find yeah. out like where the origination of that yeah, came just, from. You can make the money anything. Dang, that's yeah. what Joe does. Because the, 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 the ticket man, the gambling man, he controls the comp. He and say whatever. So Lyle, what was your prison hustle? My prison hustle was, I had two, I owned a store. I owned a store like my brother, I uh, had a couple of them. And I worked in a butcher shop for years. So I was in charge, and we had microwaves. So I was in charge, I had all the raw meat. Wow. Pause. 
I had all the <laughs> that, that young boy that stuff. Right? Edited wrong. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I, I had all I had all the raw uh, products. So uh, you know, in Italians, you know, they like they don't like to go to chow. They they big. They like to cook. They meet balls on the weekend, football, and all that type of stuff. So you know, I bring them all the ground beef, the steaks, raw steaks, and they cook uh, the turkey. You know, yeah. So you know. And what's crazy, right? You see how you see how the cultivating is? We couldn't, we haven't spoken. But basically, we're doing the same, same hustle thing. without even speaking. I didn't even know he was doing this until he can't, until like we was able to talk. And he's it's like, like that gotta, spiritual connection. Yeah, like, yo, we're going to find a way how to get it. How to get money, yeah. <laughs> what's your relationship like with your kids as they're getting older? When do they realize like their their dads are spending life in prison? What's that, like a conversation? See, in the beginning, we kept it from like, I was in school. I was in college, right? So my daughters just come see me, especially at Wyatt. I'm in college. And we don't like daddy college no more. You can't even touch them, right? Because, you know, why they got the glass up and all that. And then as they started getting older, you know what I'm saying? They're like, dad, you ain't in school now. You've you been in school like the last six years. What are you talking about? They, they about 10, 11 now, right? And then I just sat down and told them, like, you know, I'm in prison. I didn't tell them I had life. I had a little knucklehead cousin who's in everybody's business. You're about the age who knew everything, going to tell my daughters that I had a life sentence. Because they never knew how much time I had. He's like, dad, when you come on? I was like, it'll be soon. It yeah. So. Was it hard for your dad to be this community figure and have both of his sons in the news spending life in prison? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I know. And we used to talk all the time, you know, and, and, and a lot of it, he had backlash because, you know, what his, you know, and it was a lot of stuff that was false about me and my, it was written false about me and my brother. And a lot of it had to do with just being a, a smack in the face to him, towards him, because he was such an activist and he always stood behind us. You know, he didn't agree with what we did, you know, and he always told us, listen here, man, you're going to do, you're going to do time. He always agreed that we should do some time. He just didn't agree with how much time we got. Yeah. He know we wasn't bad kids. We made some mistakes and they act like the mistakes we made wasn't redeemable. Yeah, and so that's what his thing was. Come on, man. Like 10 years. I mean, people getting 15, 20 years for, for killing murder. people, for murder. My kids first time going to jail and you giving them a life sentence for drugs that you don't have from testimony. You know, it was unfair. So he fought for us in that aspect, you know, and, 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 and a lot of it, a lot of the stuff was done. I feel a lot of stuff that happened to us was done, you know, as a smack in the face towards him. How many years go by until you guys get your first glimmer of hope that there could be something other than life in prison for you? Well, with me, it, um, with me, I exhausted all my pills, almost all my pills, but I always kept hope. And I just put frivolous things in court. Anything that came out, I'd be like, I'm putting it in. I'm, just to have the fight. And it was um, February of 2019. We was on lockdown. I was in Gilmer. And they slid a, uh, a letter under my door. It was a public defender. What was her name? Uh, Kelly. Kelly Barrett. Kelly Barrett. They said, uh, you potentially can get some type of relief off the new First Step Act. First Step Act. And I'm like. We on lockdown, so I'm getting a little excited, but I've been shot down so many times. I'm like, whatever, man, you know? So we come off lockdown, and I actually called them. I called my parents first. I'm like, man, they said, she's like, well, call them. So I call them. I said, yeah, I want y'all to do my uh, do my pill or whatever. I, yeah. She said, okay. She said, I can't promise you anything. So she was optimistic about everything, you know? So I asked my mother. I said, did, did uh, LT get his? She was like, no, not yet, because I think I was one of the first ones they, they, they reached out to. And then uh, eventually they reached out. I guess he, you, either you reached out to them or they reached out nah, to you. They, she sent me the letter and I ripped it up. Because <laughs> you were just done with <laughs> it. Like, at nah, I, I said, man, yeah. I'll get mine a different way. What year is this for you 2019. guys? 2019. But like how many years in uh, in your I sentence? Had, I had 19 years in. I, yeah, 19, we had 19 little years. Over 19. Little over 19 years. Okay, and you got this. When, when does like the hope come then? Well, I hear Lewis had texted me. You're communicating with Lewis Allery. Yeah, yeah. Really? Because me and him was in Raybrook together. Wow, that's awesome. So Lewis is texting me all He's like, yo, I got something for you. I'm like, he always just talking. He's a good you know? talker. So he said, yo, it's a new <laughs> law. It's a new law coming out, man. I'm working on I'm You working on a new law. He's free. At He's free. Okay. He went home, I think, in 2013, 14 from Raybrook. We was in Raybrook together. Okay. And um, yeah, so he's he's out there. And um, yeah, then it started gaining momentum. Then I see Van Jones on TV. And they're talking about it. But I'm like, I got three life sentences. You know, so what are they going to do for me? So right at that point, I'm saying, well, what if they just give me like 35 years and I get a number? 
I'm bank. That's all I wanted was 30, 35 years so I could see something like, be home before I'm 55, 60 years old. That's what I was hoping. And then my brother go, they, he went in front of the judge first. Or no, he went second. I had another co-defendant went first. This is for resentencing? Resent they remanded us back to court for resentencing. Because of this new law the that new passed? new law. Okay. So who gets resentenced first? You do? I do. And what do you get sentenced to? I, I got released from court. Right then and there? Right from court. So you went to court from prison not knowing, you were planning on coming back that day. Yeah, I didn't, listen, when, backtrack a little bit. When I got the letter, I ripped it up, right? The lawyer calls my counselor. I have a, a, a legal call, and she's telling me about the first day. I'm like, yeah, all right, mm -hmm. right? And then she tell me, uh, I said, yeah, I said, but I got, because it's, it's basically about crack. She said, yeah, I said, but I got a lot of heroin in my case. He said, yeah, but don't worry about that, right? Because every time we, we put motions in, they'd be like, yeah, you, when, when Obama signed the crack law, yeah, it applies to you, but the amount of heroin y'all was selling is still, still going to get a life sentence. So, so that's my thought. I'm like, yeah, all right, this ain't this crack law or whatever, but I got heroin too. She said, I'm telling you. This, this is going to help you. And I'm going to get you out. Right? This is what she tell me. She said, I'm going to try my best to get you out. So they, they strategically plan. So all my co-defendants is getting these letters now because it, it, it might apply to us. But they strategically plan to do me first because I'm the easiest one. I don't have no violence. I don't have no pass. And my prison record is impeccable, right? Yeah. You know, I was like the model prisoner. I did a lot of programs. You know, I did all this stuff, right? And uh, so I go to court and we have a new judge, man. Listen. A good thing we had a new judge, you know what I'm saying? And uh, the prosecution going hard because she know if they give it to me, that everybody comes home. So they're fighting against us. Oh, they going super hard. Now they, I felt like I was a terrorist or something. <laughs> she, man, she was saying stuff. I'm like, yo, are you serious? I did, I've been in 20 years. Yeah. But she was going so hard, right? And mind uh, you, not to cut you off, this is the same prosecutor from 20 years ago. The same the one. Same the same one. prosecutor. The same That's usually not normal. Yeah, well, the male you know. retired, but she was the, the female. She, she was the female. She, okay. She was going. And this is bad. You're back in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah I'm back, back in, in Connecticut. So, okay. So you're back in Connecticut. You go to this hearing. Yeah. But you don't think anything of it. No, nah, I'm just hoping like, you know, say maybe I said maybe, maybe not right. But all my family in there, you know what I'm saying? They got family matter shirts on, right? All dressed in black, right? So yeah. it's courthouse packed. Right, and he's a black judge now. Right, he used to be in the NAACP, so he knows the unfairness. He's a fair judge, you know. So uh, my, my my lawyer making an argument. I speak, you know what I'm saying. Tell him like, you know, my plans and what to do if if I'm able to get out. You know what I'm saying. And uh, he have a recess. Lewis and uh, Van Jones team is there. Really, the first step team. Yeah, yeah, they they there. The first step back team that yeah. passed the bill. They there with the cameras and everything. Wow, because it was like, yo, you coming home. Right? Yeah. I'm like, get out of my face with that, man. For real. You know what I'm saying? I don't want that hope. You know what I'm saying? I've been, yeah. My parents been hearing that for the last 20 years, right? So the judge come back and uh, give me a media and say, I'm sending you to time serve. And what's that feeling like going through your head? Yo, I just sat there, right? And just like tears just started coming down. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, all the work that we had to put in, all the money that was spent, right? And this, this and, I, and I thought about saying, yo, this is the mercy of God, right? Because, like, he let me know, like, your money couldn't get you out. Your lawyers couldn't get you out. I sent you a public defender. You know what I'm saying? They, out of nowhere. And you got released from prison. I saw all of them. Was, I'm just sitting there. I'm just started crying. My lawyer hugged me, right? She put her hand on me. And I said, thank you, man. Then they sent me and put me in the back. My little brother ran. My little brother uh, had a change of clothes for me. Little tight stuff they wear now. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk out of the courtroom, man, there's everybody. He got on Facebook Live, so everybody that knew me. Yeah. You know, the, the, like the, 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 the city show love. They all came to see me now. And it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And if you were to watch the First Step uh, movie, right, the First Step Act uh, documentary, yeah. at the end, I, I'm the first one walking out. That's awesome. Like, I'm on the cover of it, like, like he's, this. He's right? the poster boy for the First Step Act movie. Because so you're, you're like see, one of the first people yeah, to get so released. Amazon no, Prime. he has, he's literally on when... If you go on Amazon Prime and you put your first step movie. I heard that came out recently, right? Okay, that's what Lewis and them. My yeah. picture is his, on his picture. Like I'm walking out of the walking courtroom. Walking out of the courtroom. That's a, I can't imagine what that feeling's like to go into that courtroom knowing that you're spending the rest of your life in prison and to get out like as a free man. And the thing is, we were, me and him was scheduled to, the, it was like a day apart to get resentenced. Yeah. So your sentence was But they the postponed day. my date. So now I'm in Brooklyn. Coming from Gilmer, I'm in Worst Brooklyn, place ever. and I find out he gets released because I'm on my way to Wyatt, and he gets released, and I was so happy. It was like a relief for me. How did knowing. you find out? 
that he got relief. Yeah. I called home. When I called, I called my brother, my younger brother. He was like, he home. He and I said, I was like, yes, man, yes. That's but awesome. I'm still, I, I'm like, okay. He had gave his time back and had 27 years. He didn't have a life sentence then. Right then, yeah. He had 27 years when, with the Obama, was it Obama? Or it was one of them laws that came back, he got 27. I still had three life sentences. Oh, so he was already off of life by the time yeah. this yeah. came through. Yeah, gave, and this was fought. another resentencing. Right. It's another resentencing. But you, so you couldn't get anything under Obama's new laws no. or anything? Wow. I had three, they, they shot me down. The same thing they gave him 27 years because I had violence. Yeah. I had, I had RICO and RICO conspiracy. So I had three life sentences. So they- um, Was so, that at the end of Obama's uh, term when he got commutated down to no, 27? No, this was, this was 08. 08. Oh, this is While 08. While he was in, okay. he was still in. Was it fair sentencing yet? I don't know what it was, I can't even. So then what happens to you after? What happens to me, uh, I go back to where he just got resentenced. I go in front of the same judge and um, he tells me, uh, okay, I'm gonna decide and sends me back to Wyatt. He don't let me out like he lets him out. He didn't let you know that day? No, so now I'm like, ah. Oh. So now I had two other co-defendants that went like a couple days after me, right? He told him the same thing, so we're all in Wyatt. So about a month and some change goes by. I'm like, man, just please, just give me 30 years. And um, somebody sent word that my two co-defendants were leaving. They got immediate release on a Friday afternoon. And I'm like, yo, what about me? And they was like, nah, not yet. You ain't heard. I was like, That's oh. got to be a dreadful. And they went to court <laughs> after me. They went to court after me and they getting released before me. So this was on a Friday. So Monday... I'm sitting there playing spades and I'm looking at the counselor's office. Every time the phone ring, I'm looking, I'm looking, nothing. So about four o'clock in the afternoon, it was lock in time. I work out, I come out, I'm taking a shower. The CEO called me. He said, yo, your lawyer said caller is very important. So now mind you, the whole block knows what I'm waiting for. They all stop what they're doing. Now I'm nervous. My hands are shaking. I go sit down on the phone. Everybody crowds around me and why? And I call, and I can't remember my lawyer's number, so I call my wife. So I dialed my wife's number, and she said, immediate release, right? I'm like, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. She said, immediate release. She said, it just came down, you got immediate release. So everybody's like, what is the verdict? And I put my thumbs up, and everybody jumped up. I told you he was going home. We That's had a big awesome. party that night, and all that, and um, yeah, and I ended up coming home. And it was funny because, I dreamed that day. I dreamed of that day so many times that before I went to bed that night, actually I wasn't sleeping, but I kept dozing off. I wrote on a piece of paper, yeah, that is true. And I put it on a wall. So now when I dozed off and I had my eyes closed, I said, please. And I peeked open, my eyes opened up and it, on the wall I said, yeah, this is true. And I'm like, yeah, five o'clock in the morning, they popped them doors and uh, I went home. So you get released from prison, you go home. What's that first reuniting like between you okay, two? He, oh, you didn't oh, send him the video? Oh, no, you don't have the video. Oh, man, you well, guys are hiding I the goods from oh, me. Oh, <laughs> I got to see the video. You got to show him the video. But, okay. um, they released me, and um, I was supposed to go to the courtroom that he was released from, right, while I'm on the, the, the van from the, the jail. But they rerouted me and sent me to New Haven County because it was too many people out there and all that. So... I come home, they have a party for me that night. And he's, he's there? No, he's living, I in, live in, North Carolina. He lives in North Carolina. I was in North Carolina. So I talked to him, he's like, man, my pro probation, he said, my probation officer wouldn't let me come down, but I'm gonna see you. You know, I'm gonna see you, hopefully I see you soon. You know, we talk and he happy that I'm home and all that. So they threw a party for me, like a get together. And I'm in there and I'm eating, like all my friend, family, friends, every, my kids, everybody. And I hear all this ruckus at the door. And everybody looking at me and they looking at the door. And I'm like, what are they doing? What's going on? And it's him. <laughs> so we uh we start we st we start walking towards each other and we just it, I mean and we just start crying. Break down. We I'm about to down. break down now. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy because I haven't seen him in I haven't seen my years. brother in 18 years. And how old are you guys each at this point in time when this happened? 45? I was 47. I was 47, 48, 47, and he was 45. 45. 20 years later, yeah. 20 years later. But we ain't seen each other in 18 years. We ain't years. seen each other in 18 years. What's the first words you guys say, like, after your moment, after you guys are crying and you hug each other, what, what's the first word? I don't even remember. <laughs> I just hugged him, man. Listen, like, all that, only I thing I do him. is I, I just look at the video, 
Because I don't even remember like the video. I'm like, I did that. I was crying like that because it shows me like boo-hooing like I'm a baby. And I don't <laughs> remember all of that because I was just so caught up in the moment. You know what I'm saying? Because you're talking about like your best friend growing up. Not yeah. just my brother, my best friend growing up. And to not be around him for 18 years and just we correspond. And we had finally got email correspondence because we was, we was uh, yeah, the prosecutor allowed, allowed us to do allowed that. us to get email correspondence, you know. So, um, yeah, but it. It's the first time I'm seeing him. Do you think that moment solidified like even more for you guys that you weren't going to ever go back to what you were doing before? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. But I mean, even before that, but we knew like, listen, I'm not putting my parents or my kids ever through this. You know what I'm saying? And and that's what we did. Like we came home, we joined and then looked back. Did you do you think your kids had a hard time growing up at school with their fathers away, like getting teased, made fun of, anything like that? I don't, I, I don't think they got teased, but I just think they just, just the lack of having that father figure there. Yeah. They all lack that. You know what I'm saying? And I was there as much, me and my daughters have, have a beautiful relationship. I got three daughters. We have a beautiful relationship now. And I always try to be in there. Like I would call them all the time. And I had a hustle. So if they needed things, right, I would send them money. Yeah. They were like, yo, dad taking care of me from prison. Like they could never say anything bad about yeah. their father. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they think, need to, I made it happen. I don't think the outside world really realizes that. Like you could use your like a commissary account, like a bank. Like you could send those checks. You could do all that. Like, because all this you have stuff. no overhead in there. Yeah. You don't have light bill. You don't have, if you don't, you don't really have a food bill. If you just eat three. And eat, then we didn't have no habits. We didn't drink. I didn't, we didn't drink or gamble. smoke, gamble or none of that. We had no habits. So we are, all, everything was profit for us. Yeah. <laughs> what was like the hardest things to reintegrate? into when you guys got out after all these years? Technology. Yeah, technology. social media technology, that's oh, it. My I goodness. still don't know how to use my phone. And I got an i10. <laughs> an iPhone? An iPhone, I got you a my, i10. You're, you're a few years behind. This is a that's 10. a game up, man, <laughs> i10. I, you got four bills, man, I'm scared, I'm, i10. Yeah, I'm scared to get a 13 or 14 because <laughs> it might be too complicated. What about like relationships and intimacy and things like that? To go that long without that, like I know how I felt after just a measly three years. Listen, What's it like we, for you we're guys? We're shocked. Yeah. We're burnt. You know, we look normal, right? And my wife would tell you, like, listen, like, far as, like, yo, the intimacy, like, because you so used to, like, sleeping by yourself for 20 years. So, like, it's not normal for us to be around, like, our spouse or whatever and just, like, touch her. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it was just me for 20 years. Yeah. That's not normal. Like, we would lay in the bed, right? And he he tell me the same story. Like, I, when I first came home, I lay in the bed with my wife, right? And I stay in a little corner. And she's like, why you won't touch me? I'm like, oh, my bad. But yeah. that's just, it just, it was embedded in you. Like, yo. We don't mean nothing by it, but it's just that you talking about, they will never understand if you, you do 20 years, you live in a certain way with another man in a cell. The affection, you're not showing another man affection. You just, it's just you for 20 years and you're sleeping in a twin size bed. And you try to sleep against the wall because the wall is nice and cool and all that. And I'm used to that. My wife used to, Say I was crazy because at 3.30, I had to go home and take a nap because that was count time for years. And I needed a nap. If I didn't get my 3.30 nap, because I took my nap every t every day at count time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I'd be irritable. But I'm okay now, but that's, that's what, it, it messed you up. Joe messed you up. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, you guys know I only did a couple of years, but like I feel like there's some scenarios where I don't even like to be touched or I don't like to be like, I, I'm very like, I won't even like shower really in front of someone like I'm just like <laughs> yeah. it's very weird and those stem now, right? from yeah. that certain things just like going barefoot anywhere no. or just like <laughs> changing in front of people yeah. like I was at the airport last weekend like back in the day before prison I'd be happy to change in front of someone but it just wasn't normal yeah, to do in prison yeah. yeah so just like things like that but I think the touching things probably one of the yeah. biggest things and like interacting with like professionals that are like counselors or whatever because it's like that dynamic that when you're in prison, you don't, it, it's just a different relationship. Like if I'm going to a doctor or something, it's like so much different on the free world than it is dealing with them like inside prison. And, and another big thing, and I know we both share this, it's like empathy, right? I don't have it because we've been through so much going through what we went through in prison. Like, yo, you had to suck it up. You couldn't show no, like, like no sign of weak. That's a sign of weakness in prison. Like, yo, man, this is what I mean. Lay down, do your time, man. And we ain't trying to hear that. You know what I'm saying? So you built that, like, whatever somebody going through, ain't, tomorrow going to be a better day. Mm -hmm. That ain't about nothing. And like with us, with so many family members passed away. Passing, we went through a lot. While we was in, like, my wife just passed away. 
she, I'm sorry. Yeah, she did. Time, she passed away a year and a half, about two years ago. And she did the whole bid with me. She did a whole, she did 15 years with me in jail. And when I come home and I was home a year and a half and she, and she had stage four cancer since 2013, 2013, 2014. And she did the whole bid with me and she, she held on strong until I got home. And after a year and a half, I was home, she passed away. So it was like, you know, it's, it's, it's you build up this, this tough guy image while you're in like not tough guy image but it's 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 hard for you to you become hard yeah you become hard because i seen my grandparents die i had three of my grandparents die who i was very close to and they all died our I had, uncle that was our co-defendant passed away yeah my one of my uncles he passed away he was my co-defendant he passed away in prison so it become you become cold you're but, surrounded by like yeah so it's like you gotta suck it up yeah like. because what you're gonna do walk around the yard moping all day so it's like, you know, you got to put it in the back. Does your pass, does her passing make you more motivated now because oh, she was there for you that oh, absolutely. whole time? She was my biggest supporter. Yeah. She was my biggest supporter. She was my backbone. She was my everything. So exactly. Everything I do is for, is, is, is because of her. You know, she, I didn't know how to, I, I didn't know because we used to keep money. We never kept money in banks. We kept Couldn't. safes all over the place. You know what I'm saying? You guys still have, digging up safes. I didn't, have, I didn't have credit cards. When we went and bought cars, we bought cars with cash or we went through somebody else to get them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we when I came home, I didn't know how to pay bills. And lucky COVID, fortunate that COVID was. So now she sat down and she taught me how to pay bills. She taught me how to, she helped me open my bank account. She taught me all the little things that, you know, y'all, everybody been doing, you know, for, for years. I, I learned like maybe in like three, four months during COVID. And, and yeah, so, so she- Everything changed, digital banking and all that. Everything. We didn't, we didn't have I, that. I didn't know how to deposit a check online. Yeah. You know from what I'm your saying? phone, right? From your phone. I mean, from, from your phone. What are um like some habits that have stuck with you guys since prison coming out and that you're using now in, in, in the real world? Discipline. Discipline and, and focus, you know, and, that, and you, you learned that in jail. You had to be disciplined, like in what you what you what you are, like whether it was with your religion or whatever you believed in, and, and your focus. Like we had we had plans to focus on getting out of prison and and doing things once we get out. So that discipline and focus still remain. Yeah. What about like things like making your bed? Like I make my bed a certain way from like oh, the he, blanket at the end, the white blanket. He, he brings shower shoes to the shower in the house. I don't really? know, man. I don't do that, man. <laughs> but uh, I did I did get in the shower with my boxers on a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. So at the USP, did you wash your boxers in the shower? Yeah, sometimes. What's like the logic behind that? You watch because you don't want to get jock itch from the you, you know you don't you put your stuff in net bags and it wash you with a thousand other inmates you ain't trying to wash your underwear with yeah. you've, been to, you've been up here where they don't have washers and dryers the one yeah. I've been to that yeah, washers and dryers yeah I had a washer and dryers you paid the guy three macros we, or whatever we had them at it. first we had them at first but then they stopped they stopped the washers and dryers. They stopped the microwaves. They stopped all that yeah, so them. now you wash it you wash your your boxers in the uh in the, in the shower. So you guys get home three years ago now, four mm -hmm. years ago. I love that you guys like came full circle. You started together, yeah. you you stayed tough. You never like went against each mm -hmm. other. You guys did the time you came out and now you're building a business again. So Lyle, what's your message to someone that maybe came from the same background and was never expecting to get into crime but found themselves making that decision to do it? What would you tell that person? Tell that person to what we always say. Learn from those that came before you, what to do and what not to do. You seen what I did, you seen all the money, the cars, and you seen where it landed me. Take somebody from your high school that was a, a, a accountant or a banker and see where they're at. So you learn from me and you learn from them. And then you make a conscious decision. That's it, it's easy, life is easy. As long as you learn from those that came before you, everything is, but when you, you, you neglect to, to look at the signs of what happened and you just look at what that guy had. Like, there's a lot of kids that's in the street that they hear stories about me. And they be like, man, and I be like, nah, it wasn't about nothing. I said, yeah, I had all that money, but in the first three years I was in prison, I was broke. I was calling my parents for commissary money. Millions of dollars, and you talking about the first three years, you know who got it? The feds got it. My lawyers got it. Bonds got it. Bondmen got it. So don't follow me. I did 20 years. You wanna do 20 years? You know, so I've said stay on a straight and narrow. It's guys that I went to school with that's 
man, they so well off and they just gradually. And they used to look at me like, man, you got a nice car. And they was in their little hoopty. I get out 20 years later, now they in mansions. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So they, they learn from those that came before you. And it's like the kids that want to get into the streets, like and that know us, they be like, man, y'all legends. And I'd be like, a legend in what? Are you guys cautious of letting your kids watch shows like Power or BMF or any of those shows that kind of like well, idolize grown, those man. characters? Yeah, all our kids is grown. So even if they were watching it, you wouldn't, would you condone they, I can't it? even tell them they don't watch it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but like the thing is like, you know, like me and my daughters have conversations and they know like, you know what I'm saying? All right, that's what it is. But because see a lot of the movies, right? They show all this, right? All this glamour, all this, the wealth, whatever, whatever, the, the parties and the, the women and, and this, but it don't show they just show them getting arrested, then it's the end of the movie. They don't show your success story after they, and the and trials. They, they don't show what you went through after all that. Yeah. A lot of times in the movie, he did all this, then he get killed. Oh, but all he remember is the shine he was doing. They yeah. don't show the years in jail, the years of people dying, the years of uh, people leaving you, people betraying you. It don't show none of that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? In, in the movie. So all they see is like, oh, yeah, he had this in the movie, boom, boom, boom. Then it goes off. Mm -hmm. Oh, he got arrested and it goes off. No, show what happened. Show like, yo, yeah, he he did. He was married and his wife had five dudes around his kid. I ain't talking about my situation. I'm just saying in general. <laughs> <laughs> had five dudes around his daughter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. His, his, his son calling three men daddy and all this. Show all that. What you going through? Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So Lonnie, if you could look at your 20 year old self right now in the mirror, what would you say to that person? What's your advice to get him to not make the choices that he was about to make? Being that we didn't know the consequences, but what I could tell him now is what my father always told us. Like, you know what I'm saying? That ain't about nothing. That's good. In the end, you're going to lose. Like my brother said, look at those that came before you. Everybody that was doing this and doing that 10 years ago or 15 years ago, where are they? Look, like, like even like in the Quran, it says, like, like, look at the nations that came before you and see how they ended up. I mean, from the evil that they was doing. Every evil that we did or somebody did 15, 20 years ago, where they at? So just look at it. If you're going to follow that same path, what makes you think your destiny is going to be any different? Yeah. It's not going to happen. You know, so I was saying, like, like you, you already know, you've seen, you've seen, we had uncles and stuff like that that did this and went to prison multiple times. But yet we thought we could do something different. There's no right way in doing the wrong thing. And that's what we thought. Yeah, let's, well, long as we don't touch no drugs, long as we don't do this, long as we don't do that, we good. Come a different way. What's your relationship like with your father now? Amazing. Yeah, my he, parents. Listen, he's living his best life now. <laughs> he's he got at all peace. His, he got his boys home, all three of us back together. We got multiple businesses, you know what I'm saying, family business, and we doing what we're supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? We in the community. We got a nonprofit foundation that he started 30 years ago that we taking over now, along with my little brother, who's the president of it, helping the youth not make the choices that yeah. we made. So we we doing a lot of things now and he's loving it. Like he's like, he's telling me like, I don't know if you know the story of uh, Jacob uh, in, in, in the Bible and in the Quran, like when he lost his family and God restored back his family to him. You know what I'm saying? So he, he said, I feel like Jacob, I could die peacefully now. You know what I'm saying? That's how he feel. If you could take everything back, would you? Or do you think that it was good to bring you to where you guys are now? The thing is we had to go through this. You know what I'm saying? Because not even so much like just like spiritually where we at, and, 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 and mentally where we at, I feel we had to go through this to be where we at now. That's you know, I awesome. mean, it was part of the plan. Yeah. You know? Well, Lonnie Lyle, thank you guys so much for coming on the show thank today. You. It was a real pleasure. I'm, you know, really excited to get to like know you guys more and, you know, build a relationship with you guys. Like you guys, Lewis, you know, everyone we bring on is great. Right. Um, and you guys are just awesome, man. Like, I, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you guys are really that, doing good. Like, I've been watching some of your stuff and and reading like the articles and stuff, and I'm I'm excited to see um, where it goes. You know, in the future, where can like people find you at and, and stuff now? Or do you guys have like a website for what you got going on or anything? Yeah, well, we have we have uh, we have the trifecta. That's your clothing brand? That, no, no trifecta is our, is our event space. Event. Oh, you guys so, got an event space. Yeah, uh, we have uh, Queen's Delight, which is a the brunch spot we told you about. We have a trucking company, JB Elite Trucking, and we also have a pregame sports restaurant that we just that's opening up in the middle of May. Where's that? That's in Stratford, Connecticut, right outside Bridgeport. Got a new spot. I better be at the grand yeah, opening. Yeah, you're gonna be. Yeah. I'm invited you to the grand opening. <laughs> awesome. Yeah.
And you guys are both still living in Bridgeport, right? I'm in Florida. He's in Florida oh, he's right in Florida. now. I come back. I live in I live in Trumbull, right outside, right outside. Bridgeport. Trumbull, really? <laughs> awesome, guys. Well, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank right, you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool.